Okay, good afternoon. It looks like we are live. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. I'm Jane Bullen, Managing Director of Nutrition Network, and I'm actually with Prof Noakes today, which is a treat. Um, and Hasina Kaji, Dr. Hasina Ji, our other medical director, is joining us today as well from somewhere else. So we've got a couple of screens up. Um, we are here today to announce the launch of the World Nutri World nutrition training which is a really really exciting training that we've built off the back of the world nutrition summit um it's got a lot of really really interesting things we've just got 23.15 cpd hours for it which is fantastic um and we're going to talk over with you kind of the highlights of the summit and you know just share a little bit of the top line of what this training's about and why we feel it's such an exciting training. So I'm going to ask you to start, Hasina, and just share with us what you think the, the really the key takeouts were of the summit for you and what, what you think the value of this training will be to those that want to sign up. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, and hello to everybody. So, you know, the thing for me about uh, this particular summit was to be able to experience how much everybody in this field has grown. Um, in, and, you know, our focus at Nutrition Network is obviously a carbohydrate restriction, uh, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, but that can be quite limiting for other people who don't necessarily want to limit carbohydrate restriction, uh, but are as interested in health. So for me, it was um, how all-encompassing the summit was. We opened ourselves to so many different views and um, some successful alternate views like uh, uh, time-restricted eating where no macronutrient was restricted. And it just gives a wider, you cast the net wider when you open the door and you're able to learn more. So we must never be afraid to have these big discussions because it is, uh, it's in that melting pot where we all learn from each other. So for me, it was that it was um, particularly addiction is the hot topic uh, recently. And no matter what diet you follow, if you're a food addict, there's another language that needs to be learned, to be understood, to be spoken. And the person, the client patient needs to be supported. Um, and that is a topic that encompasses all. So, you know, each day had a specific theme. And for me, it was continuous learning and enjoying seeing my, um, my colleagues grow in their field. Thanks so much, Christina. Yeah, it really was amazing to, to kind of bring in different perspectives. I really enjoyed that as well about the summit. Prof, what were your highlights of the summit? Well, I think um, it seems so long ago because it was, it was so amazing. And I apologize if my memory is not as good as it might be. But I do remember that the, the thing that took me on was the addiction story. And particularly, I honestly think it was one of the best hours that I've ever spent at a meeting. And I, I realized that we changing behavior is obviously the key. And as we were just in a discussion here today, that you can give people the information, but they have to change the behaviors. And getting rid of the food addiction is, is absolutely critical. So at the moment, I'm planning to write an, an editorial saying the elephant in the room is food addiction. And that unless we address that food addiction, we can't stop the obesity diabetes epidemic. And in our own research, showing people who reverse their type 2 diabetes, it's those who change their behaviors and get rid of their food addictions. I don't want to suggest that that was the only topic, but for me, that was definitely the high point. And it's something that we really need to, to focus on more and more. Thanks, Prof. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, there was a lot of really, really fascinating integrated stuff. So my actually my own GP herself um, gave a talk at the summit where she talks about the connection between the vagal nerve tone, nutrition and gut health. Um, and also talked by Dr. Laurie Rauch about how to go from fight or flight to a state of rest and digest. So that focus on the connection between trauma and emotional well-being or lack of well-being and health is something that I also think is a new really really important piece of the puzzle and um, that that we've missed to some extent and we haven't put enough focus on um, it's something that's really close to my heart I shared 
a little mini version of mindful eating, which is something that I love that comes from the mind body medicine body of work, um, which is again around, you know, we look so much at what to eat and how to get the back is right and how to to get the calories right and how exactly how to do things but we don't spend time thinking about how we eat and the environments in which we eat and the sort of places that we eat the spaces the mindset that we're in when we eat and how that's received by the body so i love those particular talks which i think are on day two of the new training um, and then there was also an amazing cooking demo, which there were a couple of cooking demos, but the one that really stood out for me was the one by John O'Proudford, because I hate bone broth. I can't make it. I can't eat it. It's my absolute nightmare. And I actually want, wanted some bone broth after seeing the way he did it and treated it. It's so amazing. And it's so to actually bring in, it was like we were bringing in all of the aspects of nutrition and food and what it means to eat and how we eat and how we live with food. Um, that felt much more included in this summit than it has been in the past. So I love that. I wanted to ask each of you to share a little bit about the actual talks that you give um, and, and just sort of where they came from, a little summary of what they're about, if you can. And I'll start with you again, Hazina. Thanks, Jane. Um, you, just before I answer that, I just want to echo, you know, what you said about mind-body, because we, when we treat a person, when we prescribe a diet, we're um, losing view of the person. So for me in my practice, I want to know as much about the person, you know, what's their family like, what's their relationship with their children, what's their relationship with their parents, how do they, is their work, their vocation, do they have a spot in the home that's just for them, you know, all of these things that address the person as a core, and for anybody watching who hasn't been to the summit, the thing I loved about the summit is that it was holistic in that way, looking at the person and not just the diet, um, and so for my topic, um, you know, I, I practice as a specialist physician, which is adult medicine, and I'm often approached by mothers of obese children, um, you know, who are still obese. I cannot in my practice see uh, children, but I do see the after effect effects of those children who've battled obesity throughout their lives. Um, and I have treated um, adult patients whose family, whose children are morbidly obese. And here's the father sitting um, in ICU after a heart attack and the children are walking in with ultra processed food and the wife, loving wife, unknowingly, unwittingly is bringing, people only want to do the best. Um, and it was, when I worked at Ritter's Care, you would see the poorest of the poor bringing um, their family members Lucozade because that was the thing you brought a sick person. So it's about, for me, my topic was about disease proofing the future and talking about, we talk about um, disease and we talk, we talk about disease, we don't talk about health. And I want to start focusing on health promotion rather than disease prevention. Because when you look to the positive and you say, you know, um, I really love being outdoors in nature, I need to do, I want to do more of that. I really love my job, I want to do that. I really love spending time with this person. I really love the way I feel when I eat this versus that. It's about just changing perspective a little bit. Um, and then you grow a nation. I mean, for me, you know, when you talk about trauma, a lot of people go, oh, but I didn't really have any trauma. And it's not really big trauma. It's micro, you know, it's, it's, it's the way you grow up as a child. Can you communicate with your parents or are you uh, being parented in terms of correcting behavior and the child doesn't have a voice to speak? So it's really a multifaceted look at how we raise our next generation and that it's not a script for the sick person in the house. It's normalizing let's normalize living healthily let's normalize eating healthy food and not have little pantry cupboards that have snack boxes for the kids that are you know full of eat some mores and tennis biscuits and things like that um and it's really about that that's really my passion it's when if people could realize that health starts 
before the child is born, you encompass, you embody health in your life, it's naturally going to flow down to your children and their children, and that's how you build a healthier nation. Amazing. Thanks so much, Asina. Prof? Well, listening to Asina, I'm just thinking of a couple of things happened to me in the last week or two. So I was in one supermarket and a lady came up to me and she said, Prof, you know, I tried your diet and I've now gone back to the dietitian and she's put me on the low fat diet. And, you know, who do you trust? So I looked in her basket and had all the foods that, that I wouldn't have suggested. And I was so frustrated. I just didn't know what to say. You know, I, I said, surely you keep trying. And if it didn't work the first time, it's not going to work again. And then as I was checking out, there was a rather large lady and I looked in her basket and it was all Coca-Cola and all the things that Hasina has been speaking about. And, I, you know, if you took a photograph of what people take out of the, of the supermarkets in their baskets, then you, there's the problem. And I looked, I remember this, looking at this lady's food and I said, there's not one nutritionally powerful food that you're eating. How can you be healthy? And it, it, it seems so obvious to all of us, but it's, as you said, it's typical to change behaviors. So anyway, to get back to what I spoke about, um, so obviously I changed my ideas on eating carbohydrates and because I found that you didn't need them and that they were, weren't harmful, but I didn't know what I know now. And over the last six months or so, I've been looking at the biology of why you supposedly need a high carbohydrate diet for exercise performance. And the theory is that there's an obligatory role for carbohydrates during exercise. In other words, if you don't have the carbohydrates, you can't perform optimally. And the obligatory role is said to be in the muscles. The muscles burn this glycogen. And if you haven't got the glycogen, then you're exhausted and you're fatigued. And that's what I taught for, for 33 years. And in fact, continued to believe until six months ago. So six months ago, I was asked to write an article and wasn't given a topic, but it was generally about carbs and fat during exercise. And I went back on all my old slides, which I'd shown for 40 years, and I noticed a major <laughs> problem that the original studies that supposedly found that muscle glycogen is obligatory in these studies when the people were exhausted and had low muscle glycogen yes indeed they'd run out of glycogen but they'd run out of something else. and you cannot draw a conclusion that this is the cause if you have two abnormalities how do you know which to choose from so yes these people had low muscle glycogen but they also had very low blood glucose levels so then I said, I wonder if low blood glucose is the real problem. So I went and looked at all the evidence that has been published to this day and discovered that if you have a, a study where you've got a control group who don't take carbohydrates and you've got a group that takes carbohydrates, if the group taking carbohydrates perform better than the group who don't take carbohydrates, it's always, 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 if the exercise lasts longer than two hours, it's always because the group who didn't take carbohydrates develop a low blood glucose concentration. And in these studies, what you see is as the blood glucose comes down, their performance starts coming down. The people start holding back. And that's explained by the so-called central governor theory that if your blood glucose is falling, your brain's at risk. So the body is not, the brain is not stupid. It doesn't say, keep running and die, it says, actually, slow down. You've got to slow down. And uh, it's interesting that when we started our research in the 1980s, that's exactly what we were looking for. The very first major study we did at the Comrades Marathon in 1981 was we measured blood glucose at the finish in the race in 120 runners because we were convinced that low blood glucose would be a factor. And in fact, it was in, in a number of runners. So anyway, so the, the lecture I gave was my history of how I came to the conclusion that there is an obligatory carbohydrate use during exercise, and it's to fuel the brain. And I've obviously been working on it since in the last month since. And it's clear to me that the brain, probably the glucose requirements of the brain rise during exercise. And so that becomes increasingly more necessary to provide
under glucose. Just to make, why is it important for the low carbohydrate community? It's important because there's a, there's a turning point. Sorry, let me just back up a bit. It turns out that about seven of us globally, there are seven researchers who drove this whole theory. And we were doing the research in the 60s, and sorry, in the 70s and the 80s. There were six of us or seven of us globally who were driving this research. And we were all convinced that it was muscle glycogen. So we didn't look carefully, but there's a, there's a turning point in the 1980s when my good friend, Dr. Ed Coyle, shows that it's reversal of your hypoglycemia, reversal of your falling blood glucose that improves performance. But he's being funded by industry that don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that you can revert, improve your performance by taking a couple of grams of glucose and pushing your blood glucose up. No, no, no. They want to say you've got to replace all the muscle glycogen that you're burning because that can be 100 grams a minute. Uh, sorry, an hour. So we can ask you to eat 180 grams of carbohydrate an hour and two kilograms of carbohydrate leading up to the race. And we can sell a lot of carbohydrate. And that model became dominant, even though the evidence didn't support it. The evidence supported it's the blood glucose. But the industry came in right at that moment, bought these people or encouraged them to switch. Ding! The evidence is it's blood glucose. No, no, no. Let's promote the muscle as the problem. And that's the moment. So now what we say to remind you why it's important. I'm right, then the most you ever have is now, it's nothing. Instead, the industry wants you to eat between 50 and 100 grams an hour. Now, if you do that, the answer is the body's got to store it somewhere and it will give you a fatty liver ultimately and cause your insulin to be elevated and so on. So that's not a good idea, but I'm also glad to report that I'm currently working with a group in Pennsylvania, and we're studying a group of runners when they eat a high fat diet and a high carbohydrate diet, and we're monitoring their glucose for the four weeks of the trial. So we've got going to have four weeks data on people training on a high fat diet and training on a high carbohydrate diet. And I think what we're going to find is on a high carbohydrate diet, it's a disaster for their glucose control. So these facts all melting together now and telling us finally that we've got the evidence that A, you don't need a high carbohydrate diet in training. It's not going to help your performance. And secondly, it could impact your health. So these are, this is kind of the extension of, of the lecture that I gave. Thanks so much, Prof. So my talk was called Fake Food Myths, Lies and Fraud. Um, and in that talk, I, I looked at sort of my history. I come from a background of marketing and marketing research and consumer research. So I talked about how marketing works, how food, sale, how food is sold. Uh, I looked at, I call them the green flags in my talk. And I looked at some examples of how marketeers use very, very clever ways to make food that is incredibly unhealthy look healthy. Um, and we all know it, but how easily we're fooled by it. Um, and then some, some other examples of actual lies and fraud in, in the way that food sold to us. So a really big, interesting area for me in terms of just how we are duped in the way that food is sold to us and how we believe things. You know, a lot of the time we're buying things that we think are healthy and putting them into the basket. When we actually look at the label and spend time analyzing what's in there, we understand that it's incredibly unhealthy processed food. And the big challenge obviously around that is what we're feeding our kids. And, you know, just tying back to what you were saying earlier about grocery baskets in the store. Mm -hmm. I was at a really, really interesting um, community of practice group meeting, which is a group of people that were systems this morning and they were presenting fascinating data on two minute noodles which is just literally it's 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 almost overtaking things like pop bread in terms of what people feed their children because you don't need a stove to cook two minute noodles and you can get them in south africa for kind of two rand fifty if you buy the bulk which is in dollars it's about one dollar fifty and that's a meal for a child of course it has absolutely no nutritional value and it's highly toxic but people are feeding their children that several times a day and i know i have this regular argument with my own son about this because he believes that it's like his childhood fundamental right to have the two minute noodles at least twice a week 
So it's it's a thing, you know, it's the, the things are creeping in that are convenience foods and that are marketed as healthy. They've got a tiny little drop of a you know piece of parsley on the corner, and we're buying them as mom because we think it's healthy or it's at least got some health properties, which is not the truth. Um, so let's go back to the summit and to what the actual training offers. Obviously, it's got a wealth of information, 23 and a half, 3.15, love the 1.15 CPDs. Um a variety of really, really interesting talkers. We in the last day, for me certainly there was a there was a build up to the last day, which had incredible Nasha Winters talking about managing of cachexia and nutrition. And um, we had the Society for Metabolic Healthcare Practitioners giving a panel. Dr. Brian Lenskers, Rob Sivers, Robert, Peter Cummins. Um, we had a talk by Dr. Robert Lustig. All of the greats, obviously, Prof. Noakes was there. Um, what else has stood out for uh, for you at the summit for both of you about the experience? So, Jane, I just you were talking about um, children again. You know, I was really happy that this time we gave quite a big focus on um, on children. And there are a couple of things if you haven't, I mean, if you don't plan on buying any of the days, you can buy them. Um, if you look at the link, you can buy it separate days, but if you don't, or individual days rather, the one thing I'd like to, to like for you to take away from this is let's stop with these myths, these modern myths about childhood nutrition. You know, so in my talk, I, I, I show the link that the sweet, uh, the um, affinities for sweet is actually genetically programmed for the baby to take to the mother's breast milk, which is sweet. So you find with children, and I'm a mom of two children, and I found that it is very easy for a child to accept something sweet, a sweet food. But a savory taste is something that your child, it will take a few tries. In my own experience, my son was quite a picky eater in terms of textures. So he wasn't a picky eater. He, 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 he didn't like certain textures. With the knowledge that I had, I made sure to intermittently offer the food that he wouldn't take. So for example, it took him a while to accept the yolk of the egg. So I tried different textures, I mixed it up and I intermittently, I never stopped offering it to him. And lo and behold, when he turned a corner in age, it was something that he loved. He never liked um, broths and soups. And I never stopped offering it to him. I, there was a rule that you will, a liver, for example, he, he never, he doesn't like liver to this day. But my rule is that's okay, but you need the nutrition that the liver provides. So you're going to have a tiny bite of it. And, he, and he'll accept that and we'll have his water ready so he can clean his palate and it's not grossed out anymore. Um, and, you know, I want people to understand that. Don't give up don't give in there's an uh, there's another um uh, uh, thing about food where we are naturally programmed to you make a lovely meal for your children and they go oh this is delicious and you make it the next time and it's like yeah this is nice and you make it the third time and they're like oh you've made that again and that's normal because the body wants you to get a wide distribution of nutrients so it's a way to make sure that you're not just uh, macro dosing on one one macronutrient. Um, and it's important that we know this. We have to be able to upskill ourselves. Um, you know, whether you have children or not, if you're involved with a child, we have to, if you're if you're feeding children, learn skills to be able to change food. Um, you know, th that for me was important. Um, Catherine Famila's meals also gave um, her rules. It's very important to understand why you're doing it and then skill upskill yourself so that you have in your toolbox different things that you can pull out. Children like um, pretty food. They like tiny packaged food, you know, so we can play around with those things to make sure that our children are getting um, all the nutrients that they have. So, I mean, as you can hear, this is something that is that I'm, I'm really passionate about um, because all around us, you're bombarded by the snack mentality and you have to pack. If, if you buy in to the snack mentality, it's, it's an ever failing game because everywhere you go to look for snacks, you will buy the wrong snacks. But if you 
change tactic a little bit and you decide to feed your children a well a home cooked basic breakfast of sausage you know well you know um with no fillers sausage or meat or, or fish with eggs you are unlikely to have a starving child who's going to um, need the snack right now and you, you're not going to have to fill your cupboards with that kind of stuff so I this is the reason why I think it's so important to 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 watch the summit because I really believe that we've provided tools for a parent if you want to make sure we want to do the best for our children if you want to make sure that your child is healthy then this is something that you can do for their future because not only are we telling you why feeding the way we feed at the moment is wrong we're actually saying do this not that here you 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 can have this option and that option so really for me um that is where health starts it's it's starting at the basics um and it's not easy it's difficult they keep you on your toes children do um but i i do it every single day um and if i can do it then anyone can do it so yeah, that, that was the most important part for me. So, you know, Joan Eflind was the one speaker who really impressed me. And I went and bought her book and I'm slowly working through it and we'll try to advertise the main findings in the book. But I spoke about the lady who came and asked me that the banting diet had failed for her and now she's going back on the, the low fat diet because the dietitian had, had told her. So I kind of left her and went and did my shopping and then I came back because I was so frustrated I looked back in her basket and it was full of apples and bananas and sport cool drinks and so on and I what I should have told her of course was that the key to eating is that you must find foods that take your hunger away and I said these foods don't take your hunger away they just make you more hungry and unfortunately I didn't quite say that to her but that was the what I should have should have told her. So that fits what you were saying. That if you're always snacking, you're always hungry to need to eat once or twice a day. In fact, that should be a rule that you shouldn't eat more than twice a day. But the dietitians, of course, are telling us we should eat six times a day at least. So those of you that want to sign up to the training, um, you can do so. The team will share a link in this live. Uh, it was really, really an amazing three days. And I'm so what I loved about it, I think you both touched on it was, I think the word is diversity, actually. Mm -hmm. There was such a diversity and an inclusion of perspectives. And we, you know, it wasn't like strictly ketogenic. It was really bringing in some interesting new different philosophies. It was sharing different perspectives and being really inclusive in the way that we look at the diet, seeing bio-individuality is important, seeing different perspectives is important. So please join us um, to try out this training. If you haven't done one of our trainings before, this is an amazing one to try because it kind of touches on all of the big issues that we our work covers and it brings in other voices. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Any last words before yeah, we I'd, close? I'd like to just add, uh, we must pay tribute to Peter Cummings because he was one of the speakers and he was a, one of the first students that we had in our training programs. And after the training program, he went home and looked at his data, which he'd collected over 10 years. And it was really, really good data. And he's written it up and he subsequently submitted it to, to various journals. But the key point again was that he shows that when you eat this diet and you exercise appropriately, you reverse all the so-called metabolic risk factors. It's not one, you don't have to focus on one. Whereas in medicine, we tend to focus on if you've got high blood pressure, you have to do this. He said, no, no, they're all linked. So as long as you're doing the right diet and you're doing the right exercise, you're gonna reverse all those conditions. And, and he, without realizing it, had reverse diabetes in a large number of his patients. I mean, he obviously realized it, but only when you go and look back over 10 years do you realize the impact you've made. And I think that's, that's a really good talk for people who want to make a difference in their communities. Because what, what we're realizing is that the doctors aren't the ones who are going to change your health. It's going to be other people trained to give this this type of nutrition advice and exercise advice. That's where the future lies. And, and 
we have put a lot of effort with the scene that puts a lot of effort in eat africa is eat better south africa campaign and i'm convinced that ultimately the the people in the community will do the teaching and we'll do the reversing we don't actually need doctors to do this we need an, a whole group of what they call barefoot doctors but they will call them something else barefoot nutrition advisors or something mm -hmm. in south africa to because that's the greatest mm -hmm. and you don't need to go to hospital to get taught how to eat properly you need to be taught in your community and that's one of the focus i focus i of the eat better south africa campaign Thank Oh, Asina, any last comments or thoughts before we close? Just to add to what Prof just said, um, I had a meeting with um, Yvette from Eat Better South Africa a few days ago, and we were talking about this very point, and she's busy with one of the poorest communities in South Africa um, at the moment. Um, and there's we were talking about perceptions that people have of foods like offal, um, you know, and really cheaper foods that are that the grandparents used to eat and, you know, perhaps still eat um, and how the perception is that you must be really poor if you're buying that. Wow, you must be doing really badly in life. And she actually spoke about um, the women in her group, men and women in her group, who now that she has given them the permission to eat these foods, when she's taught them about how nutritious they are, what people normally do in the community is they put it in a plastic bag so that no one can see what they're buying. And now the mothers are walking to the shops in the location and they're buying their offal and the chicken feet and the things like that. And they're proudly walking through the streets because they now know that it's healthy for them. So, you know, if, if people at, at that level struggling really just to put food on the table are able to make the change, then I have full confidence in the fact that we can, if we continue this work and continue to talk about all of this, we can make a global change. Um, and, and that's why this work really excites me. Thanks so much, Asina. So thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your time with us. And hopefully we'll see some of you on our training. Have a lovely day further.